Thank you very much for um, uh, inviting me to give the talk. And I'm really privileged. And uh, what I'm going to share with you is something which um, I had been working on for many, many years. So uh, the insights that we have developed through this work, and also uh, this is going to be part of one of our book, which we have signed up with um, Springer for building up, so right on the India's energy futures. <clears throat> so the research questions that we had in mind is that uh, if there is going to be a transition for energy system for India, then if it is going to be low carbon, and what is the possibility of that? What's the time path? What, what will be the components of different sources in this low carbon future? And um, so which one is relatively more prominent, which we can see as of now? And uh, who are the actors who are driving this uh, transition? And what are the different landscape level changes which are also helping this transition? And uh, also there are other bun bunch of questions which keep us uh, thinking through when we look at the future for India is, uh, what are the challenges for governing this transition? And uh, is there an alignment of the national and the subnational goals? And is there network of actors who can provide robust governance? Is there an adequacy of policies and politics for governing at the national and the subnational level? And how are the horizontal linkage in this whole governance system are functioning. So what I'll do is that I'll try to uh, start looking into the historical perspective and then what is really uh, changing over time and which gives us a hope or a direction to go forward. Uh, I always say that India has one very big advantage of uh, the structural uh, composition of the economy because with the service sector as very large 60% of the total GDP, then what happens is that which is relatively less energy intensive makes it, gives a standard advantage to the economy. <coughs> but if you look into what has been really a very prominent, um, prominent, uh, uh, prominent achievement in terms of India, in terms of energy efficiency, is the industry sector really took the lead. So I always say that if we understand what really happened within the industrial energy efficiency achievement, that can give us some lessons for replication to other um, sectors. So this is something which I really love and where I say that if we look back to 1973, right, so early 1970s, middle of 1970s, then we could explain that the growth of industrial manufacturing production was 100% coupled with energy growth. So it is exactly the same, the yellow and the blue line, right? And uh, so structural change and the technological advancement really doesn't show up anywhere if we decompose into different uh, factors. Look at 1980s to mid 1990s, right? So we find that you can see that it's here where really some decoupling started. So 1994, 95 onwards. And very interestingly, since then, if you see it, look at this current, uh, I mean the past decade, right? Where you can see that there is a clear decoupling of activity growth. This is the manufacturing activity growth, right? And this is the energy growth. And this difference is explained by the energy intensity decline. And this is the energy intensity, and this is the structural change. So very interestingly, from 
past decade actually, the, within the industrial sector also, some structural changes happening. So more share of the non-energy intensive industries is also getting more and more into compared to the energy intensive industries. So another very important issue which we looked through the producer behavior modeling is that if you look into from 73 onwards, you can see that how gradually it is becoming more and more, <coughs> sorry, the energy is getting substituted by other factor inputs. We did our studies prior to 73 also, starting from 50s onwards. And if you look into those, then you will see that there was high degree of complementarity between the factor inputs, energy and capital energy, and labor was only getting substituted, but energy and capital were highly complementary. But from 73 onwards, we find that the technological progress has been such within the industrial sector, which is substituting energy more and more, right? So this is also visible here. And why this is so important to me is that when we did those studies prior to 73, uh, 73, then we could see that many studies across different countries showed that the capital and energy are complementary to each other, which, from which we derived, many of us derived the result that, well, if there is any kind of energy tax or carbon tax, that will actually slow down the productivity growth of the industry sector. But if you look into these, this is very interesting, which says that, no, it's not actually going to slow down the industrial productivity growth. So there is some score for carbon tax, which can actually lead to further change in the behavior of the producers going towards more energy saving. So it's just not only that uh, the energy efficiency which has happened, but the process technologies within the industry sector has advanced a lot. <coughs> if you look into this, then this is for the cement industry. You can see that how <coughs> the process technologies has completely shifted. And if you look into the steel sector, but also cutting across all the sectors, these are not the same. But it is varying, but we can see that how process technologies are changing for the different industry sectors. So it's energy efficiency, process technology change, and that is helping many of the Indian industries to catch up with the best practice technologies of the world. So it's interesting that cement and uh, aluminum are almost with the best available technology. And these best available technologies are by the specific energy consumption of 2009. And what we saw that for iron steel, there is still a gap. And for paper, there are gaps. The reasons we could find out because there are many small units which are actually not helping us to get to the best available technologies for the sector as a whole. But from that point of view, cement is doing much better. And there, uh, I mean, really uh, much of the change has happened. Another very interesting um, uh, figure which we could include in IPCC report also was that uh, we tried to answer that are the Indian industries spending money um, in terms of emission reduction? And can we find out a levelized cost of carbon and at what ranges they are spending? So this is something which is uh, I mean, based on the data uh, which is officially available in the website also, because there are several programs like uh, Energy Award Program, Environmental Award Program, Bureau of Energy Efficiencies Program. So from all those, what technologies have been adopted and what cost? So we used those data to build up this. And so you can see that how across different industries actually, everybody is have 
actually used up almost all of their low-hanging fruit, that means which are at the cost of, um, so if you can see these blue ones are zero to 20 US dollar per ton of carbon. per ton of CO2, and so you can see that actually some of the industries, if you look into the cement industry's performance, you can see that they have actually made very high cost replacement, so they have actually gone to the even above $100 USD uh, spending for making their units um, uh, catch up with the best available technologies. So, our question was, why are the industries doing these, right? So we interviewed them and we tried to know what they are doing. So this is how we could actually line them up that it's the competitiveness which they are looking for within the market, either if it is traded or even if it is within, then there are many players. So they are trying to do the market competitiveness. So this is something which is really um, pushing them towards adopting all these different kind of changes going beyond energy efficiency as well. And then, of course, there are um, influence of policies. And what are those policies? I'll just show you in a while. And then also the price consideration in the sense that what is the price, uh, output price in the market, and then the uh, consumer demand and uh, exportability. So, and we could see that uh, but this is something which, I mean, covering all what they are doing and how we could uh, line them up uh, in terms of priorities which they have given. And then we saw that for emission reduction, specifically for emission reduction also, many of the industries are actually doing a number of steps in terms of recycling of waste within the uh, industrial processes. Also, there are several energy conservation, conservation measures which they are, <coughs> sorry, adopting, and energy saving measures which they are adopting. And these are something which are cutting across all these industries, the energy intensive industries which we have interviewed. So also there are some renewable energy technologies which they are integrating with their production processes so that they can increase the input from uh, cleaner fuel within their production process. So the, within, within the companies also, within the industries also, the internal policies are changing and which are helping them to move away more and more from use of coal to other cleaner fuels. So if you look into the policy domain, very interestingly, I would say that it, you really need to go back to the early industrial policies. So industry sector policies, industrial policies, were some of those which were actually um, driving many of these activities actions. And it's just not the industrial policies, but then you can see that there were environmental policies. And environmental policies were mostly for local environmental standards. So for um, CO, NOx, so those are the things which they were trying to control. And so they had um, a very uh, stringent, um, I mean, uh, targets for each of the um, industries. And the pollution control boards had a monitoring system with them. And so that has also driven many of these um, uh, actions uh, when they respond that is the policy, environmental policy, which they have really uh, responded to. And then you can see that from 2006, the climate-related policy integration has also started. So it's not that India internally not responding to climate change. So they are coming up with new policies, new, new uh, environmental policy of 2006 and National uh, Action Plan on Climate Change of 2008.
So if you look into this, then you will see that most interestingly right now, the policies uh, around the enhanced energy efficiency. So as you see that there was energy efficiency anyway happening. But then government made it that there should be enhanced energy efficiency. And so this is something how this really fits into the whole um, achievement. I'll show that. And then uh, there is perform achieve and trade, which is like more or less EU emission trading scheme. So this is for the different industries. And where uh, these, I would say, the additional climate responsive policies, which uh, the government implemented for the industry sectors. So what we did was that we took all our, um, you know, I mean, uh, industry level information and the producer behavior models and the parameters and worked with the GCAM model to answer two questions. One was that, well, so if we look into this, then this is the reference scenario for 2050 for Indian industries. And then we said that, okay, so if there is the 2008 um, enhanced energy efficiency improvement for India, then how far can we really reduce uh, besides what we had so far been doing? So we could see that, well, this can be the trajectory if we do the advanced energy efficiency technology scenario. And then we tried to look into that, well, if there is a global carbon price and India is responding to that regime, then how far can we go? So we could see that that will lead us here, right? So with all these, what we wanted to say was that, so it means that just the national enhanced energy policy improvement is not going to take Indian industries to the meet the two degree goal. So what more needs to be done is something which we saw here is that, which means that if we look into this, then it means that the non-energy intensive industries, which are no way um, um, I mean, what should I say, controlled by any of the policies. They can do it on their own, but they are not under the policy regime. So unless they are brought into the picture, so new policies or new actions are imposed on them, then in no way the two degree goal compatible industrial um, energy growth or emission growth can happen in India. So when we say that uh, the, with the climate action plan, things are happening, but it means that more needs to be done to uh, achieve the global goal. So we try to derive the implication for this industrial sector. If this has to happen, then what it means for the power sector. So we could see that which would mean that, so power sector, this is the coal right now, right? So 63% of the total generation. And then this shows that, okay, the GK model tells us that, okay, so it means that all coal and fossil fuel should be supported by the CCS. Renewable share will be 24% and nuclear should be 30%. So this is one of the scenario that we get from GCAM, right? But we tried to see that, is this something which is really happening or is this something which we see what is happening in the power sector in India, whether this is possible or not? So what we did was we were, we were looking into the different, uh, oh, sorry. So this is something which we are saying is that we did up to 2050 and then this is 2012 we started and then what we looked into was till 2030 all government documents say what are their ambition and what they want to do. So we took those and then looked into the population growth and the GDP growth and then we tried to see that to match that growth and taking the 
government policies, what it means if we really build up the uh, reference case scenario for um, 2050. And we say it's realistic because this is something which can happen. So this is something which we looked into. And we find that, yes, by 2030, the coal can see the peak by 2030, and then the coal will be declining. And uh, we can see that most of it is going to be met by solar and wind. That is the wish or aspiration in the, at the policy level. Uh, if you look into the capacity, then it means that by 2050, still you will see that some coal capacity will continue. And in that, I mean, till 2030, whatever the government aspirations are, government policies are, there is very, I mean, you can see that the role of gas is declining because India's own exploration is declining. So from that point of view, you can see that in the, in the, near, uh, in, in the coming decades, the plans are not such that which can really lead us to more gas or, uh, yeah, so more gas. So if you look into this, then what really matters is that if we are really planning for low carbon, and then if we are looking at the coal capacity, what will still be remaining till 2050, then we see that coal is continuing till 2050, right? And if you look into the generation, then these are the different generation breakups. So we can see that still, coal is going to have a major share. If you look into among all, then coal is really going to still dominate, right? So this is something which, is, uh, which, is, uh, um, which needs to be considered if you are really looking for the low carbon future. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you look into emission, that's also going to be almost uh, dominated by the coal. So that is something not new. But what we did was we tried to do an investment analysis. If these are certain things which needs to be implemented, then what are the necessary invest? How does it matter if you are going to make investment as a necessity? Because it's not just the levelized cost of carbon per ton of CO2, but it's really what matters is what is the investment, first investment that is needed. Why? Because in India, there is need for new capacity addition, new capacity creation. So what will be the investment need? This is something which is very important. And what are these 10th, 11th, it, this shows is the five-year plan period, which we had been following so far. So this is something we are just going up to 2050. And then we are trying to see that in different time point, how the investment needs to be made, given that the generation and the capacity creation need to follow that path. So we could see that it's interestingly, this highest one is, if you look into this uh, purple, green, these are all connected to different share of renewables. You want 70% renewable. We had a very ambitious 100% renewable also. So what are the investment needs, right? So we could see that it is very interesting that this is renewable is going to be very high cost, very high upfront investment need. And which gives uh, me a question that, so the, the ambitious or aspirational level of uh, solar expansion that India is thinking, how far that will be supported by investment figures? Because never ever before such an investment has been made in the power sector. So where from this money will come and how this investment can be supported. So I see this as a major barrier for a very high aspirational renewable energy unless there is 
real invest how you meet the first cost investment um, uh, compared to other uh, other uh, alternatives uh, so this is the same so we just wanted to uh, do it so Another analysis what we try to do is that, yes, if it is the coal which is going to continue up to 2050, how can you make it even less carbon intensive? So the one what we tried to do was that we looked into the supercritical and ultra supercritical, and we thought that if we can, if we can start doing from, so this is 2014, is past, right? So when we thought that actually, so this should be, so we should stop all the, any new addition of any subcritical coal power plant, and all should be supercritical or ultra supercritical coal based power plants. But still, we see that there will still be some subcritical capacity still be existing by 2050. But from this point of view also, I would say that not all investment are going away from the subcritical. Still some subcritical are happening. So this is also something which worries me that how do we really make it, I mean, low uh, carbon. So this is something which we saw, saw that, okay, what can be done if we do the phase-wise investment? So if we phase it out over time period, and then we try to see. Uh, so this is almost what we did is replication of this. So this is nothing new. So, so we wanted to, I'm just giving one example of one state and the case study what we did. So what is the dilemma when there is an investment decision to be made in the power sector for low carbon growth, right? So one of the question was that, so suppose there are two technology options, right? So one is replacing coal with new and renewable sources of energy, and the other one is improving the station heat rate, right? So there we could find that if you look into this, um, the cost, then this cost per megawatt is something which is really holding this back. So it is true that many components of the solar energy is becoming cheaper and cheaper, but if we look at the from the investment point of view, <coughs> it really raises the question. <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry. So we were trying to look into that what are the other sectors, how they are emerging and what is really happening, just not looking into the industry and the power sector. So we saw that the mega cities are the real, I mean, power consumers in uh, India, right? So <coughs> everywhere. So we did this for and the Calcutta city where I live. So what we found is that you can see that how energy use per unit of the city's contribution to GDP is coming down, which is green line. But you can also see that how the energy use is increasing, right? So it is growing because of the population growth, activity growth, and so these are, so one positive thing, as I said from the very beginning, that industry sector also, it's the energy efficiency improvement. This is something which we can also see that energy intensity reduction, which is really happening. So technologies are getting efficient and efficient in terms of energy use, but then activity growth and population growth is driving this. So we also tried to look into that. Um, uh, so within the household sector, what are the possibilities? This is something which we saw 
what is the appliance demand growth in India, right? So if you look into this, then you can see that how, I mean, all different kind of refrigerators, air conditioners, television, so all these, how they are growing, right? And uh, then we were looking into that, well, if this is the growth, and this is something what we found that if you look into the <clears throat> best practice refrigerator in the market, and this is something which is, we, we did a household survey, right? And so from there, we could find out that what kind of technologies people are using. So we looked into the average, and we saw that there is so much of potential that can be realized by making it as um, energy efficient appliance standards. So there are appliance standards, but then in the market you also get the energy inefficient refrigerators as well, right? And all, all appliances. So from that point of view, we could see that there is huge potential. So we could <coughs> see that for refrigerators, the <coughs> rural and urban potential, how much is there, right? And <clears throat> so with all these, we also try to see that, yes, technology is one important component in bringing in the changes, but also how the behavioral response, how they are emerging and how they can be managed through maybe non-price policies and what are the possibility of getting those into place. So what we did was um, we were looking into uh, the um, uh, uh, mobility sector, right? So because uh, I did not quote here because we did this behavioral uh, stuff earlier also for residential, uh, say lighting equipment improvement and how the rebound effect is. So we looked there that uh, in the rural areas, they are really high where there is unsatiated demand. And uh, then we tried to look into the urban areas and we wanted to see in the mobility sector what is happening. So we could very interestingly found, find that there are some super conservationist behavior we could see, which is so far we have seen that it's the um, a take back or the rebound is high, right? But then we found some of the super conservationist behavior, and then we tried to take a closer look at that. What is really driving that? Because these are the, some of the indicators which can be worked on for future policy making. And so what we found was that uh, because in the urban areas, the unmet demand is declining, so they are getting affluent, and so they are now able to meet most of their demand. And so this is one. And the other thing is that there are awareness of economic gains from energy efficient behavior. So people are really looking into the gain, what they're getting monthly savings in terms of their expenditure. <coughs> and then, there are many incentives to use the energy efficient appliances which are coming up. And larger issues like environmental and climate impacts. <coughs> Sorry. Of rising energy consumption, people are becoming more and more conscious. And how this consciousness are increasing, we could see, we, could, we had a question on how they are uh, getting exposed to these new uh, information and awareness. So they could see that they are attending courses, they are being, um, uh, being many awareness programs done in their offices or in their workplaces, and these are the things which are making them aware. And so those are also driving their super conservationist behavior. So what we could see is that, so beyond price mechanism also, there can be more, many more parallel policy options which can be implemented. And those are like, say, <coughs> because we did it for 
uh, Indian cities. So we did it for all India, any, any cities through an online survey. And so what we could see is that these are um, a really, uh, I mean, because we could see that the improvement in the promotional material can really make some difference. Because what we are, uh, uh, when, when the promotional materials are there, then they are saying that how much free mileage you get per, um, uh, per liter of, uh, mm, uh, per liter of, petrol uh, and the gasoline, right? So, uh, but what we could see, we, we tried to understand what this super conservation, why they are doing that. So from there we could find that, no, basically if you can change it to how much fuel is saved per 100 kilometer, then you are giving them a message that when you are buying this car, you are not getting a free mileage, actually you are getting a free, uh, I mean, you can save fuel. So that is the fuel saving behavior, which is driving their behavior, might be a better entry point rather than that kind of um, advertisement or promotional material. Also, we found that if there are a, a comfort level of the public transport system improves, then many people are really moving out to the public transport. And congestion management, is a major, major issue in the Indian cities because that really leads to longer detour and that how, that's how their um, uh, I mean, consumption increases. So we could see that, uh, I mean, many of the behavioral barriers which, um, which are actually acting as barrier for energy efficiency improvement and their impact, technical efficiency improvement, that can be handled by um, uh, uh, implementing many other policies simultaneously. And um, so the last thing that we wanted, I wanted to share with you is that, so given that there are climate policies also, energy policies also, industrial policies also, so now really the commitment um, to the international um, <clears throat> forum is really governing many of these things. So I really wanted to know that how this climate governance is um, emerging in India, whether this is on the right track or not. So interestingly, what we found was that um, this is how I show the climate governance structure, multi-layered climate governance structure in India, which is like, uh, so the national government, which makes commitments to the global goals. And then it uh, talks to the private sector investors and the multilateral funding agencies, and also it talks to the state level. So this is the horizontal uh, link and this is the vertical link. So if you look into this, then I can say that this upstream linkage is pretty good. So they are making commitments, they are making pledges. So this trust building is happening. But if you look into this, this is very weak because this is not integrated with the national goals. So this is really weak. And although there are state action plan, et cetera, but we know how these things are happening. So this is really not well linked. And if we look into this, that horizontal link, this is emerging at a very slow pace. But I would say that some push from this side is leading to some kind of governance changes, but not, uh, not from this side to this side, right? So these three links are still very weak. So if we want to make a transition through climate governance, then many, many things really need to improve still. And uh, just one, one or two examples that where things have gone wrong, where things have been right. So if we look into the um, vertical integration, so new technology. So I would say that, uh, so for mobility sector, the intermediate transport is very important in India. And how this intermediate transport sector, say for example, there is a big external um, autonomous improvement which is happening, say maybe uh, motorized uh, rickshaws or 
uh, electric rickshaws, etc., which are happening, which are intermediate, which are market-driven, uh, uh, I mean, very local innovation-driven, but they are not getting the uh, support from the government, and so they are not staying in the market for, this was happening for quite long. But recently, these things are changing uh, quite a bit. But I would say that so far, they failed for maybe past 20, 25 years, because there was no new routines or new rules which were getting into place. And if you look into the Perform, Achieve, and Trade and the CDM, which were actually market incentive-based uh, uh, mechanisms for energy efficiency, there you could, you could see that there was a whole systemic approach which was taken, very well planned, and very well articulated. So they have been very successful. So something which was very top down and which was well planned and articulated, that happened. But then this really did not happen because now there are a poly generation. How do you really do the distributed generation? Later on, you integrate it with the grid. So these are very, very much at experimental stage, I would say. But there is much needs to be needed for the systemic approach that needs to be added to that. So with this, I'll stop here. And I acknowledge all my scholars and students who have worked with me for all these years, and with these, Thank you very much. OK, so we have time for uh, some questions. And I'll help you moderate the question. So we start out with students. OK, how about uh, right there? Yeah. Thank you for your talk. It was really great. Um, I had a question about the realistic DAU scenario. So in that one, you show the natural gas actually tapering down and the renewable energy component growing. What did you use as something which was, you know, sort of factoring the intermittency? And the second part of that, so were you looking at batteries or storage? Uh, the second part of the same question is, did you, in your analysis, did you consider what would be the ultimate cost of electricity? And considering the fiscal health of utilities is already pretty poor, what does the renewable, growing renewable energy electricity generation do to that sector? Okay. This is a good question because what I'm just saying is realistic in the sense that what, um, what till 2030, what um, investment, so this is before what uh, the promise in Paris. So this is not with the Paris Agreement. We, have, we are developing that, but that's a different one, right? So this is something what has been put in place so far as investments are concerned, what capacity is going to be, in which state, and in uh, which year. So looking into that. So that is realistic, we are saying, right? So what has been happening, so you are just continuing that. So from that point of view, what I would say is that um, uh, the renewables, uh, that's something which has been happening. So you were just progressing it, right? So but one point that's what we showed that the investment is need is going to be very high. So the worry is unless there is realization that this investment is really taking away many other investment, this is something which worries us where this might fail. So this is something which is one important question that, yes, whether this investment need can be met unless there is a new money which is coming in here. And only hope is that new money is there a little bit. So this is my, my, um, uh, uh, my way of looking at it, right? So what is that new money? Because there is a coal tax in India now. And this National Clean Coal Fund is a huge amount of money. So if directed properly, there is a hope. OK, more student questions. Yeah, right there. With the possible exception of Delhi to a small extent, uh, environment has not become an election issue in any states in India. Do you think that's a major barrier to execution at the state level of the national plans? Um, I would say that. Um, mm, 
there are many uh, very interestingly if you look into the local environmental issues and local environmental problems uh, they have been in india the policies have been for since 1970 and they have been implemented very well right as soon as it comes to the global uh, emission and uh, there the international position of india matters a lot and that really gets into uh, the issue of how the people are going to respond, right? And uh, given that there is need for development, so if you put the environmental issues first, it will be very difficult to uh, get through the people's mind. But the policies are there, but I'm a little doubtful now because many of the uh, environmental policies are getting relaxed, which is not very happy thing happening. But again, there are a few tightening things which are also happening. So uh, I do not think that you can make environment as a um, political issue very closely. Yeah. It's C difficult. C can I follow up a little bit on that? So you know what we've seen in China, <clears throat> our concerns about local air quality mm -hmm. have gotten to be yeah. you know very high on people's agenda and as the middle class grows and they begin to travel and see a beautiful blue sky and then come home and realize how bad pollution is. So, you know, and, and the major Indian cities, you know, suffer, you know, especially inland cities suffer very badly from that. So you don't sort of, there's not kind of a groundswell of concern about local air quality in, in New Delhi. No, the local so. air pollution is, um, uh, as an, is an important issue, right? Mm -hmm. Say, I'll just give an example that uh, uh, when CNG came in Delhi, when LPG came for uh, Calcutta, Bangalore, and many other cities, right, in the transport sector. So those were high on agenda. And uh, I have not shown you, so we have actually that, at that time you will see how there was a fall in the pollution and everything. Mm -hmm. So now again, the pollution is increasing because people are using more of transport, right? Mm -hmm. More of pri private right. transport, congestion, etc. So I think this is now again gaining Mm -hmm. um, okay. prominence. And so th that it has led to major changes like uh, the introduction of the incentive for electric vehicles uh, and the public transport mm -hmm. um, using the more comfortable public transport and that is um, increasing a lot okay. in India. And I see the positive thing that because private sector are driving that. So that will, uh, you can see it will be happening faster. Okay, so more student questions. No? Okay, all right. Um, okay, general questions. We have time for, for one or two. Yeah. Um, how about in the green? Yeah. Okay, I was just wondering if, um, because there's this concern about the population, more people, more pollution, et cetera, what, what are they doing to encourage uh, people to have fewer children or anything? Uh, uh, very interestingly, India's population growth has been declining um, since 1960. So if you see now the population growth rate is around 1.18 or something per annual and 2050 it is going to peak and then the absolute number is going to go down. So uh, India has a very strong population uh, family planning policy and which works at a very grassroots level also. So the, this is declining consistently over time and this is in place since 1950. So, so it's happening. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more, and then that'll be it. Yeah. I have a question about the future of coal in India. Say again. I have a question about the future of coal in India. Yeah. On the uh, business future scenario, you showed that the coal industry will go down in the future. Quite a large part of electricity consumption in India in 2050. I was wondering whether um, new coal power plants, whether you think they will still be built around that time, or whether the coal generation at that point will just be the power plants that... Till 2030. All the plants are that till 2030, new additions will be made. Yeah, because just to meet the whole demand. Okay. Let me be very frank, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, what can be the alternative? That those are the things we really need to think. But what I'm just saying is that till 2030, we have to build new coal fire plant. 
let's be very practical. Okay, all right. Well, I think we're going to wrap up. Wrap up. Oh. So thank you very much. Thank you.